uh, in the growth, pers- uh, in our growth. That's this, that's God's desire. You need to have an understanding of what God desires from you. What is that thing that God has for us? And that's what Peter is trying to show um, to us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9. Let me read that verse for you. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look at the richness of those words that Peter uses. This ordinary fisherman, after an encounter with God and being anointed by the Holy Spirit, years later of being a pastor, he's writing this letter to the people, to all of us, and he's telling us, there is something that you and I need to understand about ourselves. That is this, that is you are a chosen generation, you are a royal priesthood, You are a a, a holy nation, God's very own people. Not Kerala, God's very own people, we, all of us. God's very own people. What a description of a Christian. What a description of you and me. That is the desire of God for you and for me. He wants to see us to be people like that. Let me take um, 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 a journey through the scriptures. All through the scriptures, the desire of God is expressly, uh, very explicitly expressed. If you look at through, uh, you know, look at how God spoke to men, dealt with men, uh, reshaped the human history, you begin to see uh, a three-dimensional aspect in the desire of God for man. Number one. God's desire for us is that we, rest, we are restored back into His image. God's desire for us is that we are restored back into His image, to be restored back into His image. You see, when God created us, after He created the whole world and everything that ever existed, after He created it, prepared it for human to come into the picture and begin to enjoy all His creation. Before He created us, after He created everything, When he wanted to create us, the first thing that he spoke to himself, which is the three persons, he said this, let's make men in our image. If there is only one thing that reflects the image of God, that is human being in the entire creation. Only you and me carry an image of God. What is the image of God? Obviously, we don't, all of us don't look the same way, uh, right? Unlike these chairs, we look different. Uh, So what is then the image of God in us? The image of God in us is this. Number one, that we have the same intelligence as God has. That God decided to share his wisdom with us. The the ability to think, reason, God gave us. Nothing else in this creation has that ability. You and me have that ability. Number two, God shared his image in the sense that he shared the ability to feel. We call it emotions. We, only we feel joyful, only we feel sorrowful, only we feel, you know, feel like smiling or feel like being sad, like right now all of you. So, you, you know, only we have the ability to feel emotions. Number three, and this is the best thing, that nothing else has this ability, that is this. And only God has that, but he chose to share it with us. He says that the ability to make a choice. It's called free will. It's called volition. That means only you and me, apart from God, can make a choice between doing or not doing, obeying or disobeying, good or bad. That is one image God gave. It's a gift from God to us. It's an image that he he chose to give to us. That's when man abused the image of God. The choice, the, the, the ability to make a choice. Man abused it and we call it the, you know, the great fall. When Adam chose to disobey the command, direct command, command from God by his own volition, his own free will, he took a great fall. And after that, anyone who is born of Adam is, called, he is born in the image of Adam. The Bible says that. So that means before Christ, all of us have the image of Adam in us. We are sinful. We have fallen nature. We 
by nature are rebellious people we by nature disobey orders we don't like rules we are born like that because we were born in the image of adam but god did not want to leave us like that so he decided that even before the foundations of the earth were laid down he saw how we would become he decides that let me make a provision for them to be restored back into my image which is through jesus christ so jesus comes into the into the into the world he on all of our behalf takes the punishment upon himself our punishment because we do disobeyed god we deserve to be punished but he decides that jesus would take the punishment that we are supposed to experience and then by taking away the punishment part the only thing that is now left is to be restored back so by believing in jesus we are restored back into the image of god that's god's desire for every human being on this earth that we are restored back into his image but not just restored back he wants us to then begin to reflect that image through our lives how would i know that you are restored back into the image of god when you begin to reflect it through your through your life through your actions through your words that's why paul all through the bible keeps reminding us something very important he says hey live your life worthy of the gospel that you've received live your life worthy of the gospel that you say you proclaim so he's saying not only what you believe but what you are saying live like that that's how i know you are restored back into the image of god you begin to reflect the image of god in your life to be restored to reflect and most importantly and i think that's the that's the whole point of this message today is this that to represent him in all creation by taking responsibility responsibility of what his creation you see the problem with us christians uh for those of you who are not christians i'm just right now talking only to christians huh? and i'll come back to you too for us is this that we think because we are now christians we don't belong to this world which is you know in one sense right but we totally got it wrong the whole concept got we got wrong that we don't belong to this world now anymore we are not supposed to do have anything to do with this world uh, uh you know and we live our lives like that you know in a you know in a in a box that we put ourselves around and we we think we don't belong since we don't belong to this world i, I think i should be here if i go there i'll get mixed up with them i i know and i want to be separate from them um that mindset actually keeps us away from the responsibility that god placed upon us truth is this that not only god restored us wants to ref- wants to wants us to reflect his image he wants us to take the responsibility of all those who who do not still have his image that we are supposed to be the people who go out carrying that light that came into our lives and begin to let it shine through the world that we are called to be the peacemakers where there is no peace that we are called to be the catalysts of the change process that needs to come into this society that we are called to be the people who take an active role in bringing justice to people not some christians who sit in a sunday morning service in small temples and in you know, mandirs and 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 uh, lemon trees and worship we are supposed to be out there in the world actually spearheading the transformation of this society that's what we are called that's how you reflect the image of god by taking responsibility in other words i'm saying this that god wants you to be a leader every one of you not one not two but all of you those who have who have christ you are a leader in the place that you have been god placed you in that you are supposed to be the one who's going to stand up against unethical practices that you are supposed to be the one that is going to stand up and become the voice of people who are facing injustice that you are supposed to be the one who would stand up and when nobody cares about needs that you will be the one who will begin to take the needs into your hands and begin to show compassion of god mercy of god to this world 
what does God require of men? Micah says that you walk humbly, love mercy, and do justice. Three things God requires from man that he would love mercy, walk humbly, and do justice. This is what God called us to be. Leaders who are standing in forefront of the problems the world is facing today. Forget about the world. Start with your home. Start with your neighborhood. Get into your, you know, in your place of employment. You are supposed to be a leader. The problem is we think leadership is, has to do with some kind of position. But here is what John Maxwell describes leadership as. And I think there is no better um, definition of leadership than this. Leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. Leadership is simply influence. What God expects from you and from us, from me, is this. That we become people of influence. That we begin to bring a change through, our, through, through, through influencing people. You see, we, we think leadership is about title and a position. But it's not about title and positions. Leadership is about how do we influence people around you for something that is worthwhile. You see, if you influence people badly, you're a bad leader. If you influence people in the right way, you're a good leader. You're a bad leader, example Hitler. You're a good leader, Martin Luther King. That's what God called us to be. People who influence others. I want you to, I want you to understand something very important. Whether you know this or not, you are a leader. Whether you agree with me or not, you are still a leader. You are born to be that, to be an influencer. Did you know that in our entire lifetime, even if you don't take up any leadership position, even if you don't say anything, don't talk to people, cocoon yourself into your home, not having any social interaction, even if you live your life assuming that you live for 60 years, in our lifetime, every one of us, whether we do something or not, actively or not, we influence 30,000 people. Did you know that? 30,000 people. That there are 30,000 people who watch your life and shape their life according to you. What you say, what you do, how you do what you do, what you believe in, how you make your decisions, everything influences them. 30,000 lives in your entire lifetime are influenced by you, whether you know it or not. So whether you take it or not, you are a leader. You have to use your influence in the right way. That's God's desire. That you begin to use what God gave you, your influence to help people to become better. See, leadership is depend, not dependent on your titles or your position. It is dependent on people discovering the gifts and passions that God gave them and using them to serve others. That's why last week I talked so much about gifting. And if you know what you're gifted with, you use that to influence people, to, 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 to make your gift worthwhile to others. As you serve them, you're influencing their lives. You begin the change process. The change that you so desire for all the time. You're looking at how spoiled your company was, how spoiled your boss is, how unethical everybody is in your in your in your in your offices, and you creep over it, you 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 criticize it, you pray to God, you sulk to, sulk to God, saying, God change them. Maybe God wants you to be the one who changes them. That you be the one who take a stand against unethical practices injustice and bring transformation in the system itself. But you do that only when you recognize what God gave you and how you can use that for the benefit of others. We'll come back to that one more time. But this morning, well this afternoon, I'm going to take two stories from the Bible, two different leaders, two great conversations in the Bible uh, and try and answer two questions. What stops us from being a person God wants us to be? And 
what can help us to become the kind of person God wants us to be. Does it make sense? Okay, if you're if you if you've been taking notes, uh, you have the white sheet, or if you're a digital person, it's on our new version, the Bible Bible app. Go to events, click on that. You'll have your notes there. What stops us from becoming a person that God desires us to be? One of the cl- most classic conversations in the in the in the Bible is between uh, uh, God and Moses. In Exodus chapter three, turn with me to Exodus chapter three. Just keep, keep you know keep your um, Bible open to Exodus chapter three. God. Let me finish the story and then come back to the scripture. Moses is, God is talking to Moses. I know our media guys are really enthusiastic. <laughs> uh, you know, there, there, there is this guy who gave up on his life. He's, he's happy with his shepherd role, taking, t- t- taking care of the, uh, uh, of the sheep, his wife and his child. Maybe he once had a dream. Once he was a passionate young man. Once he wanted to do something with his life and achieve something great with his life. But as life got onto him, he realized that he is, he is not really good enough to be a leader. Maybe he thought my job is, uh, is, is good enough to, by taking care of, uh, of the sheep in this God forsaken land. And that's where God finds him in a, in a place. Absolutely nobody, uh, you know, nobody is around. All he has was sheep around him. Um, all alone, God is talking to him. 80 year old, he's not 20 year old, 40 year old, he's 80 years old, God is talking to him. And he's saying, hey, I want you to do something. Leave the sheep that you're tending to, and I want you to go to this land called Egypt. Of course, you know that, you know that land. Uh, You came from there, right? Why don't you go back there? And all those people, they are suffering, and they are praying to me. I heard their cries. I want to deliver them. I want you to go and deliver them. I'm sure Moses in his mind is, you know, is saying, really? You want to deliver them? Why don't you deliver them? Why should I go and deliver them? As God told him to go give this task, look at what Moses is talking to God. Verses 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Who am I? That's the question we usually ask God when God asks us to do something. Who am I? I'm not, I'm not, I think you got the wrong guy. If God, you know, if if I tell you, stand up in your company uh, for, you know, for unethical practices or doing something wrong, you'll say, not me. I'm not the guy. You got the wrong guy. We have our own insecurities. Probably because of past experiences, bad experiences, or probably because you saw somebody trying and failing, and you're saying, if that guy failed, I'm nobody. Who am I? You can see the insecurity of Moses when he replied to God. He's talking to God, huh? And he's telling God, who am I that you want me to go and start delivering those people out of Egypt? Who am I? That's usually our excuse to God. Who am I, God? I'm not the right guy. Then God goes on to talk to him and says, no, 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 I'm going to be with you. I will go with you. Now, in order to help his insecurity to be to be taken away, God then begins to describe the whole chapter, uh, the entire chapter 3. God begins to describe what will take place when he goes. This is the only place in the Bible where God is talking to a man and he's telling him the future, his future. You know, everywhere else, God only tells us a little bit. Only here, he's talking to Moses and he's saying, Moses, when you take up this job and you go, This is what will happen. Pharaoh will rise up against you. People will not believe you. But I'm going to be with you, making sure that that I would use my power, making sure that you would deliver the Israelites out of the hands of 
uh, Egyptians and you would bring them, I would help you to safely bring them through all through this desert and take them to the promised land. God actually told him the future of how it's going to look like. And then look at what Moses is saying. Chapter 4, verses 5. But Moses protested again. What if? What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say to me that the Lord has never appeared to you? So much sounds like us. Eh? Exactly like us. First, who am I? Now, what if? Okay, God, I understand you're asking me to do this. But if I go to people, what if people don't believe me? What if they start making fun of me saying, God never spoke to you? What if? Fear, you know, that's called fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of future. All this, you know, 45 minutes of message asking me to be a leader is all this nice. Tomorrow if I go, I don't know what will happen. What if I lose my job? What if my boss looks at me and laughs on my face and tells, get out. Fear. What if people don't believe me? What if people don't listen to me? That's how we normally react to God. That's what keeps us from doing what God wants us to do. That's what keeps us from becoming the kind of person God desires for us to be. Who am I? What if? Number three. Then God go, goes on talk, talking to him and saying, No, no, no problem. I'll make sure they believe you. I'll work on your behalf. I will show my glory through you so much that people have to believe that I am speaking through you. Now, in spite of that much explanation from God, by the time you come to chapter 10, chapter 4, verses 10, Moses is saying to God, But Moses, three times it's a but, huh? But Moses said, No, who am I? But Moses protested again, saying, What if? Now again. But Moses pleaded with God, Oh God, I'm not good with words. I have never been, and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. So much sounds like me, huh? like you. Okay, all this vision and all good God, and I'm not good enough God. I have never done this God. If I stand up in front of people, nothing comes out of my mouth God. I have never been. I have never. You know, the sense of inadequacy, the sense of inexperience. That's an excuse that we give to God. I know you are asking me, God. That's what he said, right? I didn't say that, by the way. Moses is saying, I know you are speaking to me. I know you are promising that you will do this. But I have never spoken to people. I have never stood up in front of people. And, and man, by this time, God's patience was getting really tested. Imagine God having a conversation with man and going through. He's saying, I want you to go and become a leader. Just like how he's talking to you. And just like how you, Moses also replied and said, who am I? Then God gave an explanation by saying, I know you are nobody, but I'm going to be with you. I'll show my power through you. Then just like Moses, you and me, we also give the same excuse saying, what if people don't believe me? What if things don't turn out to be the way it, they're supposed to, like you are saying? In other words, you are telling God you are a liar. Uh, you know, that's what you're telling to God, right? When you say, what if things don't happen the way you're telling me? So we call God a liar. And God still shows patience to us and says, no, 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 I'll make sure everybody listens to you. No, no, I will make sure your power is, uh, you know, my power is displayed through you. Then you tell him, no, God, but I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. That's what he said. I'm not good enough. So God told him, all right. I'll bring somebody else who's good enough. I'll bring a guy who can speak better than you. He will be your voice. You be my voice. So basically, God is saying, I'm not giving up on you, boss. I'm going to speak to you. you. You tell him and he will speak on behalf of you to people. God still wants him to be the leader. Did you see that? Still wants him to be the leader. I'll bring somebody else who is strong in your weakness. 
they will do the job that i'm asking them to do but you still be the guy if i was in that position with you know in the position of god i would have got really mad. by by then i would have spotted him like a mosquito god tells him that so i'll send your brother who has a better voice he'll speak my word but moses verse 13 one more time but moses pleaded again with god lord please send somebody else so much sounds like us I mean, almost every single excuse is just like us. First, we said, "Who am I?" Then we said, "What if?" Then we say, "God, I have never done this." God says, "I know, but I'm going to get you somebody who will help you with this." Finally, you say, "I don't think I'm the right guy, God. You got it wrong. Get somebody else. That person is better than me. Maybe that guy can do this." Reluctance. that's when god got really angry with moses he was you see at up to that point every excuse moses gave was reasonable yes he is a nobody yes he is somebody with an experience he doesn't have the resources neither does he have an experience yes he is somebody there oh, you got to stop messing up with my phone my microphone um is somebody with uh, uh, you know with a chance of a failure yes but that that's not you are basically telling god god you got the wrong man when god is talking to you that is the right you are actually telling god who is the right guy can you imagine the conversation now it so happens that that's the kind of conversation every day we have whenever god asks us to do something whenever you see something going wrong in the society whenever you see something going wrong in your workplace something wrong injustice happening to your workmate or your classmate and when you keep your mouth shut that's the conversation you are having with god you are telling god i'm not the guy get somebody else see god wants you to take the responsibility of the creation that he is so lovingly created that's how uh, he wants you to reflect his image so the question then is what helps us to become the kind of person that god desires for us to be what helps us to become the kind of person god desires us to be in one word right perspective You see, all the excuses that Moses gave, all the excuses that we are giving are true, right? We are inadequate. We come from God-forsaken families. We have no skill sets. We have no experience. We don't have anybody who is backing us up. They are absolutely right. All of them are right. Your excuses are valid. but in order for you to overcome that excuse problem and begin to do what god wants you to do and become the person that god desires you to be you need to change the way you look at yourself you need to start looking at yourself through the eyes of god that is what peter was trying to show us in that one single statement in second second peter chapter first peter chapter 2 verses 9 peter is telling us you are a chosen generation your royal priesthood a holy nation his own special people a few weeks ago we were at, i was at a conference called gift conference some of our worship team was there we had a speaker called lt jaychand um who is one of the you know foremost thinkers in our country uh, when it comes to christian dance brilliant man we're going to have him we'll try and have him in march uh, to speak to us on a sunday service he did a he started off his session in fact uh, you know he did almost six sessions i think all through the gift conference and he stayed in chapter 1 of genesis and exposed simply exposed chapter 1 of genesis just like that 
all these are all the people who attended the conference are pastors heads of ministries you know big big ministries and all of us are like <clears throat> there is so much in chapter 1 you know that's how we explain things so while talking to us about how we lost the image of god and how god restored us back into the image of god and what is the image of god he used three words what we don't know is this that when we are restored back into the image of god we are not only we are not only saved but there is something else that is happening to us that we are being transformed into christ likeness right and he explains he uh, you know the, the scripture talks about what that image is he says this all of us are kings and queens not in the sense of prosperity gospel okay all of us are kings and queens because god is the king when you become his child by that adoption you become a king and a queen did you know the very first command that god gave to man is to rule after he created adam and eve god told them rule the world so when you are re- restored back into the image of god god is actually saying hey now take the responsibility of the creation the thing that is going wrong all around you you can't ignore it anymore now you have a responsibility because you got the title kings and queens number 2 the second thing that god image god's image talks about is this that we are all priests and priestesses not one person who stands on the pulpit and preaches but all of us are priests and priestesses all of us are now human representatives to god we are standing on behalf of the world representing the humanity to god you know the old testament description the, the job description of a priest is to represent human beings to god did you know that that they stand in the gap between god and people and plead on behalf of people for the sins people have committed stand for people So in other words when he restored his image God is saying hey you are supposed to take the stand for the people around you instead of praying God destroy that person destroy the people who belong to that particular party destroy people who are trying to go against the church instead of praying that you're supposed to pray for them Did you know that God help them to see the reason priests number 3 he calls us to be prophets and prophets that we are separated to be the voice of god to the people in second corinthians chapter 5 verses 20 paul calls us christ ambassadors imagine the intensity of that that statement that word huh? ambassadors you are the representation of god in this world you stand on behalf of god in this world you know the person who represents the president of our country in sri lanka in america in in yemen in saudi arabia or in or in china is called an ambassador if the president of india wants to send a communication to president of china who do you think he will use did you know the descript- job description of an ifs officer that an ambassador speaks on behalf of the president of india to the president of china or america or britain so he this guy who is standing in that country and representing the this country india and the president of india is actually the voice of the president of india to that country you are the voice of god in this world that what you say is what god wants to say to the world imagine the power of your words now christians those who have christ you are christ representative in your class you are christ representative among your neighbors you are christ representative um in your workplace 
you stand on behalf of God. That means when you say something, it's actually going to become true. Instead of using words to criticize people and wishing that something would happen to them, maybe we should start speaking life into them. Maybe we should start speaking life into our companies, our businesses, our, our neighborhoods. That God would bring peace, God would bring transformation, God would use us to bring the transformation. Does it make sense? That's a perspective. You see, it isn't. You need to recognize who you are in the sight of God. You need to understand this, that leadership is about others, not us. We tend to think the leadership is about us. That's why the, the title leadership and the position always is something that either we are dreaded or we always want it, greedy for. One of those two. But truth is, leadership is not about us. Leadership is about others. Serving others by following them. And one more thing you need to understand is that leadership is that we live for Christ, not for ourselves. Again, in the same chapter, chapter 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 15, Paul says this, He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Now, that our life is not about us anymore. It's about Jesus. It's about others. That's the right perspective. So how do I develop that right perspective? I want to give you four truths for you to develop the right perspective. Can I do that? Even if you don't want, I'm still going to say that. So write it down. Four truths that you need to know using another story from the Bible. Judges chapter 6. Turn your Bibles there, and I think this is such an important chapter and a passage for, for you to remember Maybe underline everything that speaks out to you today. Judges chapter 6. This is, this is another conversation of God with man. We already saw one conversation of God with one man. This is another one. Verses 11. I'll begin there. Verses 11. Okay. Before I go there, let me just give you the background. The context of chapter 6 is this. That people of Israelites have committed sin against God. So much so that they forgot God. So God allowed them to be taken over by a group of people called Midianites. That's another country that came and overtook them and completely destroyed Israelites and oppressed them. So, you know, the Bible actually says the enemies came in so many numbers that they were looking like the swarms of locusts. In, you know, now you don't get to see that in the city of Hyderabad, but in, in, in olden days, farming days, when the, you know, the, the, when the locusts come and they eat up the crop, they, just doesn't come, they don't come in Small groups, they come like millions of them at one go. And whole whole crop is eaten by them. Bible descri is describing the Midianites like that, okay? Swarms of locusts, like swarms of locusts, they have come and they're, uh, you know, settled in Israel and are oppressing Israelites. So in the middle of all that oppression, people are now calling out to God and they're asking God to rescue them. And now God meets a guy who is also as scared of... Uh, 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 of Midianites as the other Israelites were. He's also as terrified as everybody else. God is talking to him. Verses 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree of, uh, at, at Okra, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of winepress to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. I mean, total contrast huh, to what he's doing. The title that God is giving to him is exactly the opposite of what he's actually doing at the time. He's hiding from everybody, terrified by everything. God is calling him mighty hero. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Did you see where Gideon's focus was? Forget about being a mighty hero. I don't even think you are with me. That's what he's saying. Like us. 
Sometimes we feel like that. Like as if God is not even with us. In fact, like, like Gideon, you know, just Gideon describing. And where are all the miracles our ancestors have told us about? Everybody is talking about how you did a miracle in their lives, how they got job promotions and all that stuff. Nothing happens to me. And you now come and tell me to do something. Didn't they say that uh, the Lord has brought us out of Egypt? But the Lord has abandoned us, handed us over to Midianites. Sometimes we feel like that, like Gideon. Abandoned, completely shut off by God. And then God requires of you to do something bigger than yourself. Like how he asked Gideon. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength that you have. Go with all the strength that you have. And rescue the lights from the Midianites. I'm sending you. He's not even answering his question. Did you see that? He's saying, God, I don't think you are with me. I don't even think you, you know, you're doing anything good for me. And God is saying, go and rescue them with your strength. Then the Lord turned to him and said, uh, um, uh, sorry, verses 15. But, the Lord, but Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israelites? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. And the Lord told him, I will be with you, and you will destroy Midianites as if they are fighting against one man. Um, it was December 26th, 1993, that I heard a message for the first time from this from this particular passage. I mean, not, not like the first time. I've heard the story of Gideon from Sunday school time, but that was the first time it started making sense to me. And um, as the preacher began to expose the scripture, um, I sat there and I started listening to it. And it's as if God was speaking directly into my heart and he's talking to me and he's saying, hey, I've chosen you to serve me. That was the first time that I actually committed my life to Jesus Christ, December 26. I remember that that evening. As we, I know, at, at the end of that camp, it was a camp, that youth camp. Probably 55 of us were, were there in in uh, beautiful OM campus, the Operation Mobilization campus. And uh, at the end of the conference or uh, camp, we sat around the um, campfire, and uh, and this this message kept ringing in my head: um, the life of Gideon and how God got God called Gideon. I felt like God was asking me to dedicate my life to full-time ministry. That was the day I decided that I would follow Jesus and uh, you know, serve, um, serve the King. I committed my life to full-time ministry. But then, you know, after, after the camp, uh, along with the campfire, even the fire inside me came down and uh, uh, you know, I kind of went away from God. Next five years, I was totally away from God. Um, 1998, another youth camp. Uh, in the month of May, I remember that. Again, somewhere in Guntur, I was there in the youth camp. I had to be there in the youth camp because uh, I was the driver who took the team there. You know, being a pastor's son makes you do all this stuff, you know, even if you don't like it. So I ended up driving this team that came from, um, from another church to speak in this youth camp. I had to drive and take them there. Um, so I didn't have a choice but to sit down in the camp and listen to them. So while he was preaching, the preacher, different preacher, five years apart, different preacher, same passage, exactly the same message. Every single point was the same. And I'm sitting right there at the back row. I'm always a backbencher, by the way. And uh, so that nobody gets to see me, you know. And God began to speak to me. I knew uh, I can't escape. By the way, if any one of you are trying to escape, you can't. He's going to catch you. At some point, you're going to stop running and you're going to look back and say, do whatever you want. You are going to come to that. Keep running as long as you want. But he's going to catch you. So he did. On that day, I had to say, okay, God. But I'm not the guy who can do this. You never want me to be in ministry. I know. I know I was, I was, I was, I, I didn't have good habits. I know I'm not the right guy. I always felt like a loner. I always felt like a rejected person uh, from the back. You know, some of you know uh, the kind of background I come from. And so I, I always felt that right from the childhood, I'm an, ab I'm an abandoned child. 
I, I, I don't, if my mother doesn't think I'm, I'm, I deserve to be lived, lived, lived for, I, I must be really worthless. I grew up with that mindset. Even though I was adopted into a good home, I always thought I was, I was not good enough. I always thought I, I'm not equipped enough. But you can't escape God, right? So I said, okay, God, I'll respond to you, your call to go to ministry. I went to Bible school, but I always prayed, God, I will do whatever you want me to do. Don't ask me to be a pastor. Never ask me to be a preacher. I hate preaching. I hate standing up and pre preaching. I mean, I, I get scared, even now. And so, not, not as, as bad as it was you know, in the beginning, but, but I'm still scared of preaching. So, I prayed, don't ask me to do, do, do those two things. And I finished my Bible school, and God tells me, plant a church. Really? I have no experience as a pastor. I have an experience as pastor's son, but not as a pastor. That doesn't, you know, being a pastor's son doesn't qualify you to be a pastor, by the way. No, zero experience. No resources. I have no idea how to build a church. Sometimes I thank God I don't have any idea how to build a church. Otherwise, Capstone wouldn't be like this. It would have been a totally different thing. Thank God, I had no clue when I started on this church on how to build a church. I had all the excuses to give God, all the inadequacies like Gideon had, and all the worthlessness that he brought us. But throughout these years, just like how God taught Gideon, just like how God taught Moses, God taught me something. These are the four truths that I've learned. These are the four truths that I think will help you to get the right person. Number one. Quickly. Number one. God knew your limitations before he set his expectations. You need to understand the truth of this. Huh? God knew your limitations before he revealed his expectations. When God looked at you and said, hey, Gideon, I want you to go and deliver Israelites out of the hand of Midian, Midianites. He already knows that you are weak. He already knows that your family is the weakest. He already knows that you don't have an experience. He knows that you are not good enough. He knows that you don't have resources. He knows your limitations. You don't have to remind him of your limitations. He already knows. You don't have to tell him, I'm small, I can't speak. He knows you can't speak. You forget that, isn't it? God knew your limitations before he revealed his expectations. That's why when Gideon was saying, you know, really, I'm the least, I'm the, I'm the worst. God is looking at you and saying, go out with all your might and deliver Israelites. Well, actually, that statement gives me the second truth. That's this. That God does not lower his expectations because of your limitations. You know, one of the reasons why we give ex uh, excuses to God, we tell God, you know, I'm, I'm not good enough. I don't have resources enough. You are actually hoping that God would tone down his expectation. He's not going to. I'm sorry about that. He still wants you to be the world changer. He still wants you to be the guy who's going to bring a transformation in the society. Even though you are saying, no, I'm not the right guy. He's saying, I'm not going to lower my expectations. It's almost as if God is increasing his expectations. Did you see that? First he said, I want you to go and deliver. Then when he gave the excuses, he says, now you go with your strength and deliver them. Increasing the expectations. We, when we give excuses, we are hoping that God would understand our limitations. And, and then reduce their you know, dreams and size of the task and the project and, and the, the, the irritability of the people and all that stuff. And God, it's almost as if I'm increasing it. That's how God is. So don't go on praying to God, saying, God, can you reduce the task? He's not going to. He's going to increase it. God is not going to lower his expectations because of your limitations. 
just because you are not experienced enough, equipped enough, or eligible enough, God is not going to compromise his expectations on you. You know this, um, for six months I've been postponing the idea of dream center. I just didn't want to talk about that in the church all the time. I kept talking to God and saying, every time God spoke to me, I kept later God, I don't think I should talk to the church right now. I should talk to it later. later. I, you know, we just came to a new place. I don't think we should talk to it. And I kept postponing it. All through the journey, God, you know, the last six six weeks and, you know, the, the time that I was away, God spoke to me through my own devotions. God spoke to me through people around me. Every single person that I met, um, uh, you know, in this journey, apparently had a story to talk about a building that God brought in. Some kind of story that they were telling about how God brought their church into existence. How God brought what uh, they were dreaming for into existence. You know, all that. And I kept saying, God, don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. Don't, don't, don't do that. Even after I came here, I kept saying, God, please, I don't want to listen to it because I don't want to talk to church about this. Yesterday, I had somebody send me a prayer that was offered by one of our kids in the church. That kind of became a nail in my coffin right now. You know, the, the prayer of a little one um, from our church. Uh, they, you know, that, that little girl was praying for Pastor Janet. Of course, Janet is celebrating her birthdays today. Nobody, nobody's happy at that. I'm happy, Janet. I love you. <laughs> okay. And so, and the, the, the prayer for her, and then the prayer turned to me. Um, apparently, she calls me, what is that? Bishapi. I don't know why she calls me that. Maybe she doesn't know how to say Pastor Chaitanya. So she just says, Bishapi. So she's praying. She's praying for Janet. Then I'm going to you know, make you listen to that, that prayer next year, right in the beginning of next year. But right now, just to give you how God is, an idea of how God but she begins to pray for me and says, God, give Pastor Bishapi a grateful heart. And that help him to pray to bring the walls down. This is a two, three-year-old girl in her prayer praying for me that I would bring the walls down. And I'm listening to that. I'm thinking, God, please stop talking to me. God is not going to lower his expectations because of our limitations. Does it make sense? Number three. God's only limitation is your expectation. God's only limitation is your expectation. You can limit God by your expectation of Him. You can believe, choose to believe that God cannot do something and God cannot do it. In your life. Because you are the one who chose to, you know, say, I don't think God can do this. And I don't want God to do this. And because you limited, God cannot do anything. So your expectation can limit God from doing what he can do in your life. Through your life. Listen. The only currency with which you can transact with God is faith. That's the only currency that is valid in heaven. If you want to transact with God, do a business with God, that's the only way to do it. Faith. God, I come to you by faith that you can do this and then God can do it. There is nothing else you can offer to God. It's a faith. And God always responds to faith. Remember that. The Bible talks about different measures of faith. We're going to do a series on measures of faith sometime next year. But here are a few types of faith in the Bible. Number one, no faith. Now Jesus looked at the people of Nazareth and said, God, I mean, I can't do anything there. They don't have any faith. Absolutely zero faith. No faith. Lack of faith, you know, in other words. Then there is something called little faith. 
God looks at um, these disciples in the, in the boat, you know, in the middle of a storm, and he's saying, you of little faith. When they were panicking, you know, that the boat would capsize. You of little faith. So there is no faith, little faith, lack of faith, little faith. There is also something called much faith in the Bible. A strong faith. Paul calls that in Romans chapter 4 verses 20. He talks about how strong faith helped Abraham to get through what he had gone through. Much faith. It's like, God, I know things are not going exactly the way they're supposed to go. I'm not able to see what is ahead of me. But I trust you enough uh, you know, to stand strong here right now. Much faith. There's something called great faith in the Bible. Jesus looks at the centurion who came to him and said, my child is not well, would you heal him? And Jesus says, well, let's go. And that guy looks back to Jesus and says, no, 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 you don't have to come. You can stand here and say, my child is healed and he will be healed. God surprised Jesus. Jesus looks at him and looks at all the people around him. That I didn't expect. What a great faith, he says. I've never seen a person with that great faith. This is God saying about a man. Huh? Great faith. Then there is something called gift of faith in the Bible. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9. He says, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is a gift of faith. This is totally different from every other thing. Huh? This gift of faith is something very few people have. It's like standing in front of the Red Sea and when God says, rise up, your, rise up your staff and divide the Red Sea, none of us can do that except for a guy who has the gift of faith. And he says, God, really? Did you ask me to just rise up my hand and divide the Red Sea? And then he rises up his hand and divides the Red Sea. Some of you have that kind of faith. You get to open the Red Seas like that. That's called gift of faith. There's also something called in the Bible, full of faith. Stephen was a man full of faith. This is one guy about whom the, 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 you know, that once one, one um, description was used only for this guy. That he's, this, this guy is standing in front of people who are holding stones in their hands with an intention to kill him. In fact, they began to throw at him. He stands there, eyes locked to his death. He's staring right at his death and he's smiling. He's like, nothing can stop me from doing this. Man, full of faith. I doubt there are Christians who can stand like that. Lock eyes with death and say, I don't care. I'm still going to stand for God. When you look at these measures of faith, you, you kind of think, I don't think I can ever be there. I know. I don't think I can ever meet that kind of standard. I know. Because I'm one of you. And so I also realized that even though Bible does not talk about this in a, with a specific title, Bible does give a hint of this kind of faith. The one faith that I think we should all have is this, just enough faith. Just enough faith for tomorrow. Just enough faith to stand up to your boss and say what you're doing is unethical. Just enough faith to rise up your voice against somebody who's doing injustice and say, you cannot do this. Just enough faith that even though I don't have any resources, this person is in need I want to do something. Can you help me to do something? Just enough faith. I think we all need that. Just enough faith. God's only limitation is your expectations. Number four, and I think this is crucial. I'll close with this. God's expectation can be your inspiration. God's expectation can be your inspiration. 
I want you to think about this. That even though God knows your limitations, that you're not good enough. He knows that. He knows that you don't have experience enough. You don't even have quali qualities enough. You, in fact, are the person who's struggling with sin and habits. He knows that. Even though God knows your limitations, that God still chooses to call you, that should inspire you. You see, instead of focusing on what your limitations are, maybe you should begin to focus on the fact that God chose you. Isn't it? So many times we focus on what we lack. Maybe we should stop doing that and start looking at the fact that God chose me, you, to do the job that He has for you. That should give an honor to Him. So, yes, you have valid excuses. Yes, you, don't la you lack a lot of stuff. Yes, you're not good enough. Yes, you're not a good communicator. Yes, you cannot on your own do this. But I trust you enough. I mean, think of this. God telling to a human being, saying, I believe in you. Even if you don't believe in yourself. Isn't that what he's saying to Moses? He's saying that, in, in fact, he's literally trying to explain that to Moses. In the conversation of chapter 3 and chapter 4, Moses, he's trying to knock on Moses' head and saying, Man, I believe in you, man. I believe in you. So maybe, instead of, Giving excuses, you should start saying, God, thank you that you're asking me, that you're considering me eligible enough to do what you want me to do as well. With that, uh, I don't know what God is asking you to do tomorrow. I don't know what you need to stand up against tomorrow. I don't know. You may not know right now, but the fact that God is speaking to you right now means something is coming in your that somewhere God expects you to stand up, become a leader, become a change agent. You could start today, you could start tomorrow. I don't know when he's going to expect you to do that. But when it comes, you need enough faith to take that step, isn't it? So ask God. If you know already what you need to stand up against, ask God to fill you with just enough faith. If you don't know, ask God still, God, fill me with just enough faith that when I stare at my problem, when you open that door, that problem to me, that I would have enough faith to stand up. Once you do that, we'll talk about how do we then make a meaningful difference in this world.